you very much, Nima. Is this on? Everybody can hear me? Okay, so uh, I've been watching you all on YouTube, which is why I know uh, Nima's little term, niggling things, which he used to describe the lack of a new physics signal, not just new signals. We do have new signals at the LHC, but we do not have yet a firm signal for new physics beyond the standard model. So uh, I had to look it up because I wasn't quite sure what it meant, but uh, it relates to it. An well, there you go. You, I've already taught you something. So annoyance, discomfort, or anxiety, I, I would say, uh, I'm sure theorists might check off all three, but I'm an experimentalist working at one of the most powerful particle detectors ever built, at the most powerful accelerator ever, ever built, and sitting on a data set that's unprecedented in its dynamic range to explore physics at the smallest scales that we have access to on Earth. So I'm maybe slightly discomforted, but I'm not anxious and I'm, not, uh, I'm certainly not annoyed. I'm having the time of my life. So, uh, the usual caveats, it's a 1.5 hour talk. Uh, I hope that's the time I was given because I filled it. And so, uh, you can't cover everything, obviously, so I will attempt some coping strategies. Minimal theory discussion, you've already had most of that. Uh, avoid as much as possible what we used to call back in the day flogging transparencies when you had to actually flip transparencies and print them out before you gave a talk. Poor grad students couldn't just arrive and, and give their talk like I just did. Uh, you had to actually print them out so, and then flog them back and forth. So I'm going to try to avoid that as much as possible. I do not have uh, um, 150 slides. I only have 80 or so in 90 minutes, so that shouldn't be so bad. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to emphasize, I, I've been trying, to, it's a hard uh, task here with y'all uh, because I wasn't quite sure what to tell you about. You, some of you may already know everything I'm going to say. Some of you may know the, the biggest points, but I, I want to try to give you something that Hopefully some of it's new to you, uh, or emphasized in a way that maybe you haven't heard yet, um, and certainly selected results that hope to inspire uh, or are at least interesting, not, not sleep-inducing. So some bias towards Susie and dark matter because you've been discussing it a lot this week, so I, I picked that out. Plus I'm, I'm now um, chairing the board that um, approves CMS Susie paper, so I'm, <laughs> I'm biased towards Susie at the moment. Um, but let me remind you first before we start, run one. Uh, the legacy there, as you know, we published many papers. We found exactly one and only one Higgs boson uh, where uh, we might have expected to find it <coughs> given the previous limits. We made many standard model measurements. We made many, many, many searches. Some of them are shown there in colors. Uh, but we did not find anything significant in terms of beyond standard model physics. We found a few bumps which we have now killed. Spoiler alert. Standard model is still going strong. In case you thought I was, I was here at the end because I had a bomb to drop, sorry. Uh, but this is an impressive plot nonetheless, and I like how Atlas has now added the fact that we actually measure the proton-proton cross-section. So we used to emphasize that we had eight or nine orders of magnitude in cross-section that we measure, but we actually have uh, 14, if you count the 70 millibarn uh, proton cross-section, proton-proton, inelastic cross-section. So this is a class that we call the stairway uh, to either heaven or the other side, depending on your perspective, uh, separated by different um, processes in the standard model, um, inclusive-like processes on the left with large cross-sections and getting rarer and rarer as you go to the right, and uh, mostly electroweak physics, um, some top physics, and now we're getting down to really rare electroweak processes with um, um, femtobarn-like cross-sections, and uh, this, we're just going to continue to go down on this plot as we take more data. So here, obviously, luminosity helps you to not only make more precise measurements, but also to extend this plot down into lower and lower cross-section, rarer and rarer processes. And the Higgs is here, too. Right? The unfortunate point is that every, uh, every block has a gray theory prediction, which mo most of them you cannot even see, and all of the blocks uh, land on the on the theory prediction, except uh, one or two, and I will talk about one of them later. Okay, so uh, no experimentalist, right? Everybody at the school's going to be a theorist. One, two, okay, Maybe lo one local at least. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you some stuff about the accelerator and a little bit about how we do the physics that we do um, as sort of cultural enrichment. Okay, LHC in run two. That's 2015 to 2018. We started up again uh, two years ago at a higher uh, center of mass energy, 13 TeV. That's 60% more than the energy we had in run one. 
and I'll tell you a little bit how we got there and what that means. The target luminosity which we achieved last year is um, twice the luminosity that we had in the previous run, which is the one where we discovered the Higgs. And the beam crossing time was reduced, the frequency, the RF, uh, was reduced from 20, 50 down to 25 nanoseconds. So the bunches are uh, half as far away as they were in run one, and that has consequences as well. So the physics rules have not changed. Uh, the primary goal of the LHC was to find or exclude the Higgs boson, so we did that. Now we, we find it again at a different energy and we make more precise measurements. We've made many standard model measurements. We'll increase the pre precision on the ones we have made and we'll start to measure even rarer processes, as I mentioned. And we continue to search for beyond standard model physics. So how do you get the 13 TeV from 8 TeV? Let me remind you that the magnets, the dipole magnets, are at 1.8 Kelvin. We have lots and lots of helium, liquid helium that we use to, to do that, the accelerator physicist. 100 tons of liquid helium to keep all the 1,200 or so magnets at that temperature. And to reach a new energy, you have to train the magnets. You, you can't just turn them on at the new current, which is about 11 kiloamps, corresponding to 6.5 TeV per beam. You have to train them. So you have to turn the knob on the, on the current until the, until the magnet quenches. And when it quenches, it typically ejects 10 megajoules of energy. So you have to keep doing this every magnet, every sector, until you get it all the way up where it's not gonna quench at the current that you wanna sit at, which again is 11 kiloamps. With a little bit of a buffer, they actually target this red line, not the green line, that's actually the energy we have. So they could go a little bit above, um, not yet to 14 TeV center of mass, but a little bit above, there's a safety margin there. But um, this is quite impressive. Uh, the, it took about a year to do this, uh, a little bit less than a year, I think. And uh, we were ready on time in 2015 in May. Uh, that's this curve down here. This is the luminosity uh, comparison, total integrated luminosity at CMS from 2010, the very start, all the way up to 2016. You can see clearly we've taken more data than we ever had, have in a year, uh, faster. Uh, even though we started a little bit late, uh, we took off there. And in fact, this is the interesting part of the curve because the machine was testing out a new way to inject beam. And I wanted to talk about this because I know you've, you've heard some discussion of luminosity. I think Leantau went over this. Um, but here's the full uh, equation in all of its glory with form factors and, and other things, including the emittance, uh, which is basically a measure of the size of the beam in phase space. So it's, it, there's a conservation law there. Um, and so you, you can make it bigger by hitting the beam with gas molecules inside the beam pipe and so on. Lots of ways to make this emittance big, which makes the luminosity small, uh, but it's harder to make it smaller. So they were working on a way to make this smaller, and the bottleneck really comes at the beginning of the LHC injector chain, where you are, are limited by spatial charge effects. You can't put in so much, uh, more than a certain amount of current, uh, and because of the aperture of the magnets, you're, you're limited on this emittance. So they came up with an idea that to inject the beam in a different way. So this is um, a picture of the beam basically in time versus time uh, axis. So there's one bunch that goes in, one bunch goes in, so on. So time to the right <coughs> is a longer scale than time on the, on the vertical axis. And as the beams come in through the accelerated chain, at some point they're split. The bunches are split into three bunches, and so you have this um, six going into 18. And then they're sent in the LHC and accelerated to six and a half TeV and so on. And, and like I said, the limitation comes here. So this emittance uh, was limited by how much current was going in here. So they, they shoved in less current, had more bunches, shoved in less current, and then brought them together and then split them in three again, but with less total charge in the end, less charge, much less charge in the beginning. And that, in, that reduced the number of protons per bunch, but it also decreased by a lot the uh, emittance. And basically overnight, they doubled the luminosity, which is why we were kind of muddling through here, and then May, June last year just took off. So that explains why we were able to achieve such high luminosity, basically 40 inverse femtobarns last year. They're doing the same thing this year, and I'll talk a little bit more about the performance uh, at the end. Uh, but one downside, uh, not really a downside, but it's something we have to deal with at Atlas and CMS, is there's higher pileup when you do this, because the emittance is smaller, the beam phase space is smaller, so you have a higher density of particles. What does that mean, pile up? Well, this is a view that has the beam line horizontal, and you're zoomed in where 10 centimeters is left to right the size of the screen. Protons come in from the left and from the right. They collide, there's 100 billion protons in each bunch, left and right, they collide. Over a distance of about six centimeters, there's a Gaussian shape to the beam. 
And every yellow dot here is a reconstructed um, charged particle from charged particles, a location of an interaction between two protons. And in this case, there were actually 78 reconstructed vertices. So this is what we mean by pile up. When the bunches cross, 100 billion protons cross 100 billion protons, and you can get up to 40, 50 uh, interactions, in this case, 78 interactions per crossing, which then all of them emit particles, of course, and every green line here is a reconstructed charged particle trajectory in CMS. So you have to sort all of that out, reconstruct the vertices that occurred, and figure out which one is the most interesting one in the event which is the one I think that has the blue line here. So we call that the primary vertex. So that's one of the major challenges in run two. We didn't have such a challenge in run one because we had lower luminosity. Um, but this challenge of more energy and higher interaction rate has to be met by the detectors. So we have more particles produced because we have higher energy. Uh, that means higher event size, bigger event size, <clears throat> more signal but also more background. And more background means higher trigger thresholds in principle, although we've been able to keep them uh, where they were before. Higher interaction may, means uh, more bandwidth, data bandwidth, so we actually have 10 times more than we had in run one. Uh, more interactions per crossing, that's what I just mentioned. And uh, now the beam crossing time is less by half, and that means that you have multiple waves of particles inside the detectors at the same time. Um, just to remind you or tell you that C this is a cutout of CMS, one pi wedge in a transverse slice. The beams uh, collide here at the interaction point. And CMS has a radius of about seven meters, so that's about 25 nanoseconds at the speed of light. So every 25 nanoseconds, you have bunches crossing, particles produced, evolving, or e, um, emanating out, radiating out in a, in a sphere. Uh, and by the time particles start to reach the end, the muon chambers, another collision has occurred, and you have to sort that out as well. So that's a new problem we didn't have before. It's called out of time pileup. Uh, we didn't have it before because it was 50 nanoseconds between crossings, not 25. Okay, so we have to keep up with the LHC, which is going like gangbusters, really phenomenal performance beyond uh, the design so far. They've uh, overachieved so far. So we have to as well. The beam crossing rate is now 40 megahertz. Um, cannot possibly take data at that rate because that would be terabytes per second. And even if you could record it, uh, you have to pump that data around and process it and, re and reconstruct it. So that's uh, beyond our reach at the moment. So we have trigger systems, as you probably know. We have a hardware trigger that runs very quickly in microseconds that uh, limits, takes this 40 megahertz down to 100 kilohertz, and then we have a software trigger that brings it down another factor of 100. So we actually record data at a, at a kilohertz roughly, but that can go up to 1.5 or so. And so to handle this uh, with the higher bandwidth, 10 times more bandwidth per uh, you know, interaction crossing, we need uh, some trigger upgrades, so we had improved in granularity, improved bandwidth, and improved resolution, which takes you in a sort of uh, you know, digital camera type analogy from a fuzzy picture to a sharper picture, which allows us to better measure, even at this rate, the momenta of the particles and, and the energies of the, of the particles, and so we can have a sharper trigger turn on. And this is what has allowed us to keep the thresholds basically what they were in run one, and we're not getting killed by uh, this additional particle activity because of the pileup. In some cases, in fact, the trigger thresholds are even going down. This is one case in CMS where the electron trigger, I guess it doesn't show it, this is the electron trigger at level one. In 2016, last year, we had a 42 GeV cutoff there, <clears throat> and in level, in 2017, we have a 40 GeV for this particular trigger. Uh, and you can see that the, the blue curve is sharper than the, than the red curve. So this is higher pileup, higher uh, interaction rate than we had last year, um, but we're doing better because of the, the improvements we made over the, the break. You can uh, change the detector, you can be smarter about algorithms, uh, or you can just be smarter about how you slice the data. This is our famous dimuon mass spectrum uh, from basically a GeV all the way up past the Z. And if you want to do B physics, for example, at CMS, flavor physics or other kind of physics that has uh, dimuons in it at low uh, Q squared, you have to be fancy about how you select the events, and this is actually events. It's, it's not an artist's rendition or anything like that, actual events there. And so we take data that we can use to, for B physics, B sub S, for example, and, and other types of physics, uh, right along as, take, as we're taking the Z, and hopefully in 20 years or so, we might see the Higgs right there at the bottom. I hope I lived long enough to see that. Uh, keeping up with the LHC means keeping up with pileup, as I said. Uh, so we now, this is from 2016, we have pileup that has an average of 27, and run one it was more like 20. 
and the tail goes all the way up past 50. So uh, we have all of these uh, potential effects from pileup that, that would really hurt the physics reach that we have. But we have created more, more and more sophisticated methods to, uh, to handle this pileup, and in fact, to identify the, the particles that are coming from the primary interaction rather than uh, the additional interactions. And just one example of this from ATLAS shows the stability of the Z mass when Z decays into two electrons. Uh, blue and red are two different pileup bins, so very high pileup and very low, or lower pileup. And this is a ratio of uh, the average mean uh, mass of the electron pair uh, for the z-peak as a function of time and, uh, over the run, and then you divide by that average, and as a function of the number of vertices, you can see that it's stable well within the per mil level. So we are able to reconstruct the electrons um, well enough that we can reconstruct z's in a very high, highly stable environment, even all the way up to 50 interactions or so. So I, I hope that uh, gives you a feeling for how we are able to survive, because in the past, people were talking about, oh my god, 50 pileup, and then for the high luminosity LHC, now it's 200 pileup. Um, but the detectors keep up, and the analysts keep up, the, the detector, um, the people who work on the algorithms that we use to reconstruct the data keep up. OK, so, uh, so that's just an overview of, of where we are now, 2016, 2017, in the new run. Um, I'm curious how many of you can name the experiment that determined that the proton has structure? Anybody? I know Pierre can. <clears throat> McAllister and Hofstetter, 1956. So this is sort of the analog of the Rutherford experiment. You shoot uh, alpha particles at a gold foil, and you find out that atoms are not big blobs of pudding, but they actually have a nucleus and electrons orbiting around. If you crank up the energy to 188 MeV uh, and have an electron beam that's actually made by humans, and you throw it at protons, and you ask, is it a point particle or not a point particle, the de Broglie wavelength of an electron at, with that energy is roughly a Fermi. And so you have a probe that has the resolution, the sufficient resolution to actually resolve the structure of the proton, and that's exactly what they did. As a function of the scattering angle, again, the Rutherford type uh, experiment, where you look at large scattering angles, and that's where the, the different options tend to spread out. And they were able to show that the experimental data deviated from the Rutherford curve, taking spin into account, uh, sufficiently that you could actually confirm that there was a structure function to the proton. Yes? Ah, uh, but that's a different curve on this plot, but it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't tell you that it has structure, substructure. I mean, I think this is the, at least this is the first experiment I know of that shows experimentally that there's a deviation from the point-like Dirac particle, whether there's a magnetic moment that's the Dirac magnetic moment or the anomalous magnetic moment, which is the other curve here. So it was, it was actually differing from the Dirac magnetic moment for a point particle and the anomalous Dirac magnetic moment was telling, was at, at, the data is actually in between those two curves and telling you that there's a structure function there that's different from just a uh, point-like particle in quantum mechanics. So I, I, I think this is the first one. <laughs> so uh, this is um, 60 years ago, and the scale here is 188 MeV. So why am I bringing this up? I, I want to show or demonstrate to you, and I think also you've seen this this week, uh, why when protons collide, protons are not actually colliding. And what happens when protons collide, we actually don't care too much about because when protons collide at the LHC, they go down the beam pipe. It's either elastic scattering, which happens all the time, or inelastic scattering, where soft particles are produced and they go down the beam pipe and we don't see that. The de Broglie wavelength for a proton with uh, 6.5 TeV of momentum is 10 to the minus 5 Fermi, so it's much, much smaller than the standard size of a proton, one Fermi. So the protons don't see uh, themselves or, or the other particle as protons, they see partons. So we should have called it the large parton collider because that's what's happening. And uh, so you, you've seen this, you have a, a fractional momentum P1 and P2 for each proton, for each parton from each proton. You wanna make a particle with mass M. To do that, you need um, two partons of X1 and X2, and then the center of mass energy comes in. And the point here is that uh, for a fixed mass, if you wanted to find, particularly a two TeV massive object. For a given center of mass energy, you need, um, if you want to produce it centrally and use all the energy to produce that mass most efficiently, you need um, X values of roughly M over E. So as you increase the energy, if you're still looking for a two TeV mass, 
you're moving down the curve on the, the PDF plot as a function of x, this fractional momentum, you're moving from right to left. So you're increasing exponentially the number of partons you have in the proton that are available to make collisions to give you a particle of mass big M. So that's where the, the, the enhancement comes. It's not just a 60% improvement in the reach, because we go from 8 to 13 TeV. It's much, much more than that, depending on the mass of the process or the, the square root S of the process that you're interested in. For example, a 2.5 TeV Gluino pair production would give you a, a boost factor of 2,700, which means the cross-section goes up and includes mostly the PDF effect. <coughs> the, it's essentially all the PDF effect that I just mentioned. Uh, and then for various masses, uh, you get smaller and smaller boosts, but at some point, uh, you have enough data in the new higher energy that you, you have more sensitivity with less data than you had before. And this was what we had in 2015, roughly a factor of 10 less data in terms of integrated luminosity, but because of the cross-section enhancement from the PDFs, we were more sensitive to many of the searches that we had already done in run one with uh, two inverse frontal barns, three inverse frontal barns of data. In 2016, we're now off the curve on the left, so we have enough data now to be sensitive. And essentially, any measurement we make, any search we make should be better than what we did in before in run one. Okay, so what would a discovery look like? When we first started up, people were asking, some people in CMS, I don't know if in Atlas too, uh, we should have a trial run. We should have a practice run where we, we pretend that we discovered something. There's an excess in some channel, and we figure out what that means and what we're gonna do. And uh, at the time, we were trying to generate our Monte Carlo and figure out that if our calibrations were right. And so I, I thought that that was not a very useful uh, way to spend our time, most particularly because whatever we picked for sure would not be what, where there was an excess, <laughs> just by probability and statistics. But luckily, we actually ha we know exactly what a discovery look would look like because we almost had one, this famous uh, 750 GeV boson. How many of you have, he have heard of the 750 GeV boson? Okay, that's what I figured. So you know the story. Atlas had a little bump, 3.6 sigma. CMS had a little bump that you can't see, 2.6 sigma, which we had a 2.3 or 4 in run one that we, nobody ever made a big deal about in CMS. And that's why our combination with run one gave us higher, sense, higher significance. But we had a very little bump. You can't even see it. It's these two bins right here. Atlas had a bigger bump. It was wider, a little bit more exciting. But the exciting point here for, um, people outside the experiments. These are clean channels. Photons are very uh, relatively easy to reconstruct at uh, the LHC. Um, we get very high precision uh, resolution on the energy that we can measure, so the mass is, highly, is very precise. That's how we found the Higgs and the diphoton channel. So we know this, uh, how to do this search. We know these objects very well. And we had two experiments seeming to give some kind of uh, hint of an excess. And then the last thing that made it interesting, and this made it more interesting for me, is that uh, if this did hold out to be true, there were many theoretical interpretations of a, of a boson state at 750 decaying to photons. So that was very exciting. We gave a talk. There were 200 papers published in four weeks. <clears throat> that has dropped off since then. Uh, there were many options, heavy Higgs, graviton, singlet, um, some other ones that maybe were less uh, interesting or popular. And so this would be the example of let's do an exercise of what does a discovery look like. Now what do you do? You have, a you have a boson decaying to photons at 750 GeV. Do you just do that more? Do you just measure it better? And it, it was, this is why I didn't want to waste any time on this before we started taking data. It's obvious what you do. It decays to photons. It has to decay to Z gamma. Other bosons, ZZ, HH, ZH, you just do everything you were doing, but you do it faster because now you have an excess. <laughs> so you're, you have, there's a natural motivation to actually uh, increase your productivity. And we had the, a few months later, we had all these channels public. We were looking everywhere, right? And, and the cool thing, I, didn't, I forgot to put in the slide, but the, the theorist then could tell us if we had found an excess in any other channel, that's, that's all of a sudden a pattern. More than one uh, measurement or more, more than one excess tells you a pattern. D the branching fractions depend on the couplings, which depend on the particular object that this thing is, and it couples differently to different standard model objects. So if I found a signal in uh, Z gamma, but not in HH or, or WW or TT bar, that would tell me something. And in fact, we had other um, searches, DiJet searches, for example, and the dilepton searches, which already gave us information about what we might expect this thing to be based on a, a diphoton rate that we actually had presumably measured. Unfortunately, as you all know, six months later, it was gone. 
no, no signal in Atlas, no signal in CMS. This is basically with four or five times more data. And, and so no signal. And nature is so humorous that right at 750 GeV in both experiments, there was a deficit of events <laughs> in that bin. Both experiments. So we both went up and we both went down. And that's not that rare. <laughs> Statistics happens all the time. Okay, so that's the trial run. We know exactly what to do. If we get any of their excess, especially in supersymmetry, know exactly what to do. We'll have another pattern of excesses or no excess that, that will tell us what type of supersymmetry we might have found and so on. So um, we're still primed, ready to go, waiting for the next excess. Okay, so uh, like I said, I'm gonna do a little bit more Susie than I usually do. I usually do two or three slides on Susie, um, but you've been talking about it. It's linked with dark matter. Um, so I want to give uh, maybe too much uh, Susie. So uh, this is my breakdown of sort of the, the, how the experimentalists look at it because it's, it's driven mostly by what kind of access we have to the different states. And the classic type of Susie search is zero, one, or two leptons, or more than two leptons, multi-lepton, plus missing energy from the lightest supersymmetric particle. You can look for gluinos, stops. Uh, you can also look for electroweak production that way. Um, so this is the, what we call, would call the classic search, and we've been doing it since we turned on in 2010 at 7 TeV. Then uh, there are other types of supersymmetry breaking that don't involve gravity or supergravity, and then they tend to spit out bosons, like gauge-mediated supersymmetry breaking tends to spit out um, photons, which uh, whether you like GMSB or not, I certainly like photons because like I just explained, photons are very easy to measure. We know everything about them, uh, their efficiency, the fake rate, the resolution, all that. So uh, if Susie is spitting out photons, we're uh, ready to go find them, and it's quite uh, a good handle. So this uh, leaves, at least for the experimentalists, a nice uh, attractive way to search for Susie, which we have. Then, of course, you don't find anything, <clears throat> and I, the other reason I wanted to show more Susie is because I want to tell you all the creative ways we have discovered not how to not find Susie. So you don't find it here, and then you look for where it's not. So you, you don't find the keys under the lamppost, so you look under the car where it's dark, and then if you get really desperate, you go in the sewer and you look down there for supersymmetry. We'll look wherever it's reasonable and not impossible to find, and so then we start to look for cases where that we would have missed before because um, objects are soft, and I'll talk about that. And then even um, our parity violating, where there's no LS, well, there's an LSP, but it decays, and so you don't get missing energy, you get other standard model particles. Uh, third generation focus studies, and now we're getting exotic with long-lived uh, neutralinos, gauginos. So we're, we're, as we continue to not find it, we continue to broaden the search, essentially. And one of the recent developments is that we provide theorists with model-independent cross-section limits, so bin by bin, uh, and chopping up the data will tell you how many events we had and what that corresponds to in terms of cross-section times branching fraction or or basically a, a corrected number yield of events. And that should help uh, theorists in now and in the future um, to uh, test out models on the fly. Okay, so you probably all know this, but just uh, in case you don't, um, we actually interpret the data in the context of what we call simplified models. Simplified model means you just don't look here and ask what's going on inside the black blob. Uh, you just have a branching fraction and that corresponds to a coupling and when you measure an event yield and correspond to a cross-section, that puts a limit on this branching fraction effectively. And then depending on the assumption about what the decay mode is, you get a different model, different simplified model. This one's called T1 TTTT because there's four top quarks in it. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is the kind of interpretation that we have come to because, uh, like I said, the sort of Susie on day one didn't happen and there's been an evolution in, in how to interpret the data in the most uh, useful way uh, that we can as we get more data. There are typically uh, orthogonal topologies depending on the final state, and even within a single final state, you can slice it various ways, number of leptons, number of, well, typically we do, event, we do analyses one, one lepton at a time, so hadronic, <clears throat> one lepton, two leptons, or multi-lepton. But then there can be a certain number of jets, a certain number of B-jets, and uh, different cuts on how much activity is in the event, and so on. So there are many ways to slice the data. There are many ways to treat the hadronic objects that come out of this type of event with four top quarks in particular. You can um, add up the jet activity in several different ways, which are s correlated, obviously, but they're correlated in known ways. And if we ever do find, when we find a signal in excess, 
what I was talking about with the, the pattern of excess uh, that we see in different channels, also within a given channel, the different way you look at the data, the hadronic activity in particular, with these different kinematic variables could tell you something about the spectrum of the particles and, and every particular set of parameters would predict a certain pattern of uh, the results in the different analyses. So we have a massively over-constrained uh, system of analyses in terms of the final states we look for and how many different ways we look for excesses in these final states. There are many final states, four tops, TTB, T, T, uh, TBTB, four light quarks, and so on. Okay, so if our parity is conserved, you get the LSP not decaying, it's stable, so you have missing energy in the event. You have to calibrate that missing energy or you have no chance to find Susie. And I like to show this plot to just emphasize that fact. Uh, before we actually do any cleaning or filtering of our data, what comes out of the detector and the processing of the events looks like the open circles. So you have a nice falling spectrum, you have some resolution up to about 600 GeV or so, and then it's flat, it's more or less flat. That's because there's all kinds of stuff going on in the detector, fake stuff, real stuff, um, particles hitting the detector in ways that are not uh, designed to produce a calibrated signal, like you could hit the light guide, for example, and, and shower inside the light guide, giving energy that is not uh, accounted for in your calibration, so you, you can have totally mismeasured energy uh, here and there in the, in the detector, giving, large, giving rise to large missing energy because you uh, invent an imbalance in momentum because you have too much energy in one particular direction, or you can just have mismeasurements <clears throat> and so on. So there are lots of ways to get uh, missing energy, fake missing energy, noise spikes, real particles like I just mentioned. Um, showers, also showers from non-collision events. This is where you get a proton hitting um, a gas molecule, say, in the beam pipe, spraying out softer particles uh, that then anyway hit the detector and, and contribute to um, the overall energy flow. Uh, so you have lots of ways you can get that. You have to get rid of this somehow, and when we do, after our very um, sophisticated cleaning and filtering and other algorithms, you get the black dots, and they line up exactly with what you expect from simulation, uh, taking into account um, the real sources of, of missing energy, including neutrinos from um, both um, Ws and Zs, but also B quarks and so on. So uh, this step is absolutely mandatory, and it's what allows us to then search for new particles in the uh, multi-TEV range. Uh, as I said, you can slice the hadronic activity and collect it in various ways. I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but here's a, a glossary for you later. Uh, you can add up all the particle, yeah, question? No. Uh, you can add up all of the particles that you see, they're PT, we call that HT, um, when you cluster them into jets. <clears throat> you can take the vector sum of those and that gives you the missing uh, HT. And then you can uh, look for topologies like this, which is a SUSY type topology, where you, you create, a, you pair produce particles, which then have some kind of cascade that ends in a particle that, does, uh, that escapes detection, and so it leaves missing energy, but you have two of those. So you have an unconstrained system, and you have multiple solutions, basically an unlimited number of solutions for the vectors for those particles. And you look for topologies of this type, the A, B here, which then go to a particle you see and a particle you don't see on either side. And then you try to figure out what is the combination of vectors for the unseen momentum that would match the uh, event topology. And then that gives you an estimate of the mass and you can search for SUSY that way. You can just add up the mass of uh, large radius jets, so try to take um, half of the detector essentially and call it a jet. There are other fancier ways to do these kind of things and then there's a specific variable called alpha t that tries to um, kill the background from QCD that is dijet events where you have symmetry on both sides. So you have uh, either low met because you have symmetrically decaying, um, well, sy symmetrically hadronizing quarks or gluons, and so you have the PT balance, or you have, uh, you can still have a high met there, but they're balanced, and so this tries to take into account that potential asymmetry in the signal, the SUSY signal, uh, that would extend out in this variable very far, and then the QCD cuts off at a certain point because uh, of the, the topology that's built into the variable. So the, again, and you can attack the same events in this, using these different variables, and, and there's cor they're going to be correlations, but you're looking at the data in a different way. Uh, and then you're chopping it up. So uh, you've all seen plots like this, I assume, but do you know what they mean? So uh, as I mentioned before, you can, you can slice the data in many ways. Number of jets, number of B jets, 
different values of activity in the event, what we call HT, missing HT, and all those fancy variables I just mentioned on the last slide. And so you can make a, a large number of different bins that have particular ranges for each of these variables that I just mentioned. And then uh, plot them all in one plot. So each one is one particular bin. It's one particular set of cuts on the data that will then give you a number of events observed and a background prediction that you can subtract and figure out how much signal's there. That is what this plot shows. It's data over estimated background. So if there was any signal, you would see it deviating from one here, and so some bins do, but there are lots of bins. So by statistics, you would expect many of them, some of them, at least to be outside one or two sigma. And, uh, this, and we do a simultaneous fit. So we, from all the background predictions, you can um, predict uh, the expected yield in each bin. You see the observed yield, and you do them all simultaneously under the assumption of a particular model. And that's more or less how the hadronic analyses are done, and some of the leptonic analyses have this kind of binning too, but uh, it, it is sort of, it may seem crazy, but it's not. Uh, as long as you have enough events, you're not actually overusing the data, but at some point you get diminishing returns with number of bins, and I always like to tease my SUSY colleagues that when you get more bins than SUSY parameters, then you, maybe that's a good time to stop. <clears throat> so the leptonic final states I mentioned, they come in uh, one or two or multi-lepton, and then if you have two, you can have same sign or opposite sign. If you have two leptons of same sign, highly isolated and high momentum, that's a very rare signature in the standard model, and so you get plots that have very few events per signal region bin, where this is um, just a counting of the bin number, basically, where you have, again, a signal region that's selected for, um, to enhance the signal. But here you have very few events, so you, you have a background-free environment, roughly, uh, versus a background-rich environment that you have in the all-hadronic channels. The opposite sign dilepton search could include um, Z bosons in a SUSY decay chain that give you opposite sign dileptons or off the peak, and that's what we call the edge analysis, and this was an exciting analysis in run one because we actually saw an edge in CMS. This would come, for example, from a SUSY decay chain that would have two leptons in sequence from a sleptino in this case, and their mass difference between the states that give rise to these two leptons would produce an edge in the invariant mass of the two lepton system. And it would look, depending on what the mass difference was, it would show up somewhere here, but it would be more or less a triangle like that, a wedge, and it would have a value, a leading edge value that would tell you the mass difference between the two states. And we had an excess in run one just left of the Z boson peak, which comes from uh, this kind of decay here on the other side. Uh, and uh, that was prime target for run two. What does that look like? And it looks like that. So there is no edge there anymore, and there's a little bitty edge here, but not, nothing significant there. So that went away. Unfortunately, that, was a, that, that would have been a classic way to find SUSY, I mean a classic way to expect to find SUSY, and a little bit disappointing, but not an anxious or, what was the other one? Annoyed? <laughs> not anxious or annoyed, but slightly discomforted. Uh, Atlas had a, an excess in this uh, analysis too, not in the edge, but on the Z peak, so you got too many Z bosons in, for the selection that you made, and that would be a signal for SUSY. And this is the background down here. This is run one again. This is the background from standard model Z bosons. And they had an excess that roughly corresponded to three sigma. 30 events expected and I think, or, uh, 30 events observed and about 10 expected, something like that. And then they have now 0.5 sigma excess, so they don't have any excess at all in run two. But CMS didn't have this excess either, and they only saw this in electrons, so it was a little bit um, not too convincing anyway from the beginning. Okay, so uh, you can do all the analyses that way that I just mentioned, um, slice up the hadronic events, ask for one or two leptons in different ways, uh, and put them all together in a plot like this that tells you the limit on the gluino mass for a particular value of the LSP mass, in this case the neutralino, as the LSP in particular models um, with particular assumptions and branching fractions and all that. And you can see that we're now getting uh, above 2 TeV um, for the gluino mass for particular values of the, the LSP mass. So th that's a classic search looking for gluinos, but it's also an inclusive search for SUSY. Um, you don't, it doesn't have to be gluino. You can also use this, all the same techniques to look for stops, so-called direct stops, where um, there's, again, a blob here for a simplified model and uh, outcome two stop quarks, uh, top squarks, uh, and then um, topologies that are very similar to the um, inclusive searches. 
And you can put all those together and, and using all similar techniques. And one point here that I highlighted down, down here that has been a, sort of a new development, it was also there at the end of run one, but if the mass difference between uh, the stop and the top, uh, sorry, the stop and the neutralino is roughly the top mass, then uh, the neutralino comes out with almost no momentum or zero momentum in the top rest frame. And so you get very little met. And so that could have escaped our detection because we tend to trigger on missing energy. And, uh, and also uh, apply analysis selection offline that uh, goes for large missing energy. So th that could have been a way to have missed Susie, and it would have fallen in this crack, uh, one of these cracks here. I think this one, no, uh, yeah, here. So in run one, you would have seen these plots and there'd be large white areas here where we had no sensitivity. And then we have adjusted our, our uh, approach to lower our thresholds essentially for particles to try to fill in these gaps, and, and this is an example of Atlas doing that very well. No sign of stops, however. Okay, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, my target end time is 3.45, right? Okay, all right, so uh, the next two topics are sort of related because you get the same kind of final state particles. They're related experimentally. You get Z bosons, Higgs, boson, Higgs bosons, W bosons, and so on, in, uh, electro -weak, in production of electroweak enos, and then depending on their mixings, whether they're beano-like, we like higgs -like, like you'll get different um, branching fractions. So um, there are uh, active searches looking for a susie like final states with high missing energy and then one of these type of bosons. Uh, you, typically when you have a Higgs boson you're looking for, you use BB bar or gamma gamma. Um, BB bar because it's a high branching fraction, gamma gamma because it's easy to reconstruct and a reasonably high rate. And you can put all those together in um, different final states that target different topologies. So uh, WZ type event, two Higgs, or uh, WH. And when you do this, you get um, Higgsino mass limits roughly up to uh, 800 GeV or so, seven, 800 GeV. This is a combination from all the latest results using the full 2016 data from CMS. Okay, so uh, all of that, we haven't found anything. The only particle I have not used yet or mentioned yet in the SUSY section is the photon, and I mentioned before that um, SUSY models that predi would predict photon production are, are interesting experimentally because this guy can be uh, reconstructed with high efficiency, low fake rate, and very good energy resolution, and it's isolated. So it's isolated high energy photons are great objects to search for anything or make measurements. So how do you get that? Um, these are alternative ways to break supersymmetry that do not involve supergravity, uh, and thus they have uh, natural suppression of flavor change in neutral currents, and so you don't have to construct a way to suppress uh, or to um, fit the fact that we don't find uh, much flavor change in neutral currents in nature, at least in the experiments we've, we've made. And thus uh, all flavor violating processes arise from the Yukawas, and basically it's all CKM. The LSP in this case is um, usually a massless gravitino, or nearly massless, and then the next to leading, next to lowest, next to lightest supersymmetric particle is typically the neutralino. So you have decays that look like this. Make two gluinos, they decay somehow uh, to neutralino, which then decays to the gravitino and some boson. And again, depending on the mixing, it's either wino-like, beano-like, or higgsino-like, you'll get um, Z, W, or, or H coming out. So, uh, and then also you get photons, like, like here. So uh, there is an active area of photon plus met, diphoton plus met, and then also using the Higgs decay into photons uh, and so on to, to sort of fill in this gap of potential other ways to break supersymmetry uh, that don't involve gravity. When you do that, you get limits that are actually pretty high. They're comparable to the inclusive searches that give uh, two, or two TeV or so on the gluino mass. Again, there are assumptions involved here, and this is in the context of a, a gauge-mediated supersymmetry breaking. Okay, so uh, just two more topics here, and then I'll move on. Um, another way to, to sort of fill gaps that we may have had in our analyses is that we had soft particles that didn't trigger the event, that triggered the detector, or we lost them after, after we recorded the data. We did not make uh, enough, loose enough selections to catch cases where you have small mass differences between the LSP and the NLSP, giving rise to, in this case, uh, very soft muons or electrons coming from the Z decay, which is highly off shell, uh, and they wouldn't have triggered the event. Small missing energy because these are also at low momentum, and so you just miss them completely. 
So we have uh, a program, now, uh, we've had a program since the end of run one, roughly 2013, 14 or so, to target these. And in, in particular, if you ask for a jet, um, which could have, for example, come from the initial state, you can boost the entire system here and then give some uh, enough momentum to the, to the, lep to the um, LSP to give you enough MET, but not uh, too much in the soft leptons. So it's basically a topology with low momentum muons and electrons and then um, some mild MET that you get from the LSPs. So this is called compressed spectra. Uh, we have dedicated triggers that go as low as we can in missing energy down to 90 GeV at, at, low, moment, at low luminosity and higher thresholds at higher luminosity, and so that's a dynamical trigger. Or you can ask for two muons explicitly and then uh, ask for a little bit less uh, missing energy. So there's a whole program here of, of targeting these kind of topologies and uh, trying to fill in gaps in the SUSY spectrum. So we go all the way down to five GeV in the lepton spectrum, which is pretty impressive for uh, muons because it's almost as low, it, roughly three GeV in CMS is where they curl up and they actually don't hit the muon detector. Okay, so our parity um, violating SUSY will give you um, final states with very little missing energy because the, there's, uh, a, there's no stable final state supersymmetric particle. There's just uh, quarks or, or leptons in the final state, not a lot of missing energy. So the typical signature to kill the QCD background, which is very high, is to ask for leptons and then uh, any number of jets or B jets and uh, low met, not high met. So we are also targeting uh, these kind of, and Atlas is really uh, probably um, even more than CMS is, is going after these RPV type uh, signatures. If you sum them all up, uh, blue is 13 TeV, green is 7 TeV for, 7 and 8 TeV for Atlas. And I drew the line at 2 TeV for the mass of the sparticle. You can see we're just touching 2 TeV in most cases. In many cases, we're uh, still below a TeV, for example, in electroweak uh, production. Same story for CMS with the same kind of uh, gap here between uh, TeV and 2 TeV. Um, so we expect in the next uh, year or two to extend this a few hundred GeV more, maybe 300 GeV or so, because we'll get up to about two or three times more data than we have now. Uh, and then we have to wait for the high luminosity era, and uh, I think you've already been uh, shown the asymptote for um, the sensitivity as a function of luminosity when you're looking for high mass particles. Um, so the real gain in the future is going to come in this region here, where we have electroweak enos and gauge enos uh, that are, the limits are around the 500 GeV range. We can actually double those with the high luminosity LHC. Okay, so uh, moving on now to the last few topics uh, that I wanted to cover. Dark matter being um, the partner to the SUSY. So every SUSY search is a dark matter search in certain set of uh, perspectives. And so um, there's a high correlation between what we do. There's hi usually high missing energy. Um, I forget who I stole this from. It may have even been one of the speakers here, <laughs> although not from the, a talk here, I don't think. But you've seen this several times this the last two weeks at least. Um, the generic Feynman diagram that um, connects the dark sector to the standard model sector with another big blob that has to be filled in with some particle that connects, uh, that mediates the interaction between dark matter and standard model particles. And then depending on how you turn your head, you either are talking about direct detection, indirect detection, or direct production of dark matter at colliders. And of course, I'm talking about the latter. Standard model particles collide. They uh, exchange a mediator, which then gives you the dark matter in the final state that you look for in the detector. What would that look like? The standard search is that you produce this missing energy from the mediator, uh, sorry, you produce the dark matter from the mediator, which then is not detected because it's weakly interacting. It's, it's most likely a WIMP in this case that we're sensitive to. And then on the other side, you want to give them, if this is all you had, then uh, you would not be very happy because in fact, if it was two to two, you would have exact equal momenta for the two dark matter particles and yes, met this way and met this way, but that would cancel out. So you'd actually have zero met if it was two to two. So you have to have some radiation to give uh, a boost to the dark matter system. And then once you have that idea, that X can be any standard model particle that we can measure. So jets, proton, uh, photons, sorry, uh, W or Z, top quark, Higgs, etc. This has led to a program in the experiments that we like to call monomania. 
monojet, monophoton, mono Z, mono W, mono Higgs now. The Hig discovery of the Higgs has given us a new handle on all these uh, searches. These are spectacular events. This is a, a real event from taken last year um, that has a, a big jet of one TeV momentum on one side, transverse momentum, and nothing on the other side. So ETMS exactly balancing the jet momentum. And could that be dark matter? Of course it could. That's exactly dark matter signature, but it could also be Z plus jets where the Z decayed to neutrinos. And that's the challenge, that's the main challenge at the LHC when you're looking for missing energy plus X and you see the X and then you infer the missing energy is dark matter, you have to um, separate it from this kind of background uh, which is the most likely candidate for this particular event. And to do that, you have to understand your jets very well, so you can go and look at W plus jets and um, calibrate your jets at a very high recoil um, over a TeV and, and see if you really understand the energy scale that you have, the momentum scale, so that you can actually infer correct missing energy on the other side. And once you are confident in that, you can look at the data in the missing momentum, and this is a case of uh, the X being a jet. So we, we identify a single jet, we then plot the missing, transverse energy, and you look for a, a, an excess in the tail of the distribution, the green being um, what I said here is uh, the most likely interpretation of this event, Z plus jets, where Z goes to invisible. <clears throat> and uh, where was I? Yeah. And that's the green here. So the dominant background in this search is from exactly that type of background. Uh, the, the data, uh, the simulation matches the data very well, and we're looking for an excess out here, which would come from, for example, dark matter mediator axial vector in this case, uh, or something else, Higgs invisible decays producing a, a, an excess here. And you can see that it's a, it's a tough battle. This is the blue line here is the dark matter mediator, and so you want to go even higher so you can get signal to background that's a little bit better. So data helps here. Data helps in a lot of areas in, in LHC. It doesn't help in some. Very, the highest masses, of course, you have this asymptotic problem, but here it helps a lot. We're going to extend this plot. Eventually, we're going to have very good signal to background, and we're going to start excluding dark matter at higher and higher energies in these uh, missing energy plus X final states. How do you interpret that? Um, so we got together, CMS and Atlas, a few years ago, uh, and developed the common interpretation framework because it was kind of chaos before that, and chaos in a way that, that sort of didn't sit well with direct detection uh, physicists. And so we all agreed on how to plot the data and what assumptions to make. So uh, this is the general picture. You have uh, standard model particles colliding at the LHC, producing a dark matter mediator, which then gives rise to the dark matter in the final state. That's the missing energy. You recoil off of something, in this case a jet, and then you count events and you turn that into a cross-section. You need to make assumptions, and what we do is plot the data in the plane of the mass of the dark matter particle versus the mass of the mediator, in this case a Z prime. So that's the, the getting rid of two variables. And then you have coupling. So you have the coupling of the dark matter mediator to quarks, and you have it, the dark matter coupling. So you have to choose your couplings. Once you do all of that, and also the coupling to leptons, because you can have leptophobic or not, once you do all that, then you can actually turn an event yield into a cross-section observation, and that's what the colors are here. And then you draw your lines for your 95% exclusion in this plane. And of course, since the mediator decays to on, uh, um, to on shell dark matter particles, there's a cutoff here. You can't exclude dark matter particles past half the uh, mediator mass at least, and then there's efficiency that drops off. So that's the, gen the generic uh, way to present the data, but then in to compare with direct detection experiments, we can convert with additional assumptions, for example, the spin of the mediator, uh, into a nucleus, uh, a dark matter and nucleus cross-section, so dark matter on protons, for example, which uh, then can, we can then um, coordinate or, or contact with the direct detection experiments and plot them all on the same plot as a function of the dark matter mass. In this kind of, uh, the, the relevant feature being the difference, the complementarity between the uh, LHC searches and the direct searches is basically the shape of the curve that you see. It doesn't really matter. Once, once the dark matter is uh, low enough, much, much lower than the mediator mass, the, um, the mass of the, the dark matter particle doesn't really affect your limit because it doesn't really matter if it's really light or moderately heavy. You get the same kind of uh, sensitivity to uh, the missing energy. So that gives us long flat line, and that's sort of the advantage of, uh, or not really the advantage, but the complementarity of the LHC. You can do dark matter searches without dark matter. 
at the LHC. So you don't actually produce any dark matter, but you, you watch the mediator that would be connecting to dark matter decay to ordinary standard model particles, like quarks in this case. So you have uh, the question mark in the digest search is usually like a graviton or, or something else, extra dimensions, strings, black holes, whatever. Uh, and then we, we look for bumps in the digest spectrum here, and you see none. Excellent. Well, you see bumps everywhere, but because there's a lot of uh, actual dots. Uh, but no e excess that's significant above the, uh, the background there. If you did, you'd get a bump. There's, these are three different examples of um, either quark-quark, quark-gluon, or gluon-gluon resonances um, that would give an enhancement somewhere to corresponding to their mass. The question mark, one recent development here is the, what if the question mark is the mediator for the, for the um, dark matter? We should see it. There's no reason why we can't. So you search for that, and this actually just plows through the phase space of possible mediator masses and dark matter masses at very high values. So basically, it's insensitive to the masses. You just don't see a bump, and you just exclude all the way up to your sensitivity for the digest mass. Then uh, there's some fluctuations in the data, and at some point, you, um, you squeeze off because uh, the, you reach twice the dark matter mass. Is the, is, this line is the mediator mass equal to twice the dark matter mass. So you, the efficiency drops off at some point, so you don't uh, have a flat line on the right-hand side. But def basically, we've excluded well past the TeV, and I just showed you the plot for the missing energy plus X, which was not even at 1.5 TeV. So this is a new way to search um, in a constrained set of assumptions, of course, as always. Um, but it's a new way to, to put a point on the plot, if you like. Another new way, because we have a Higgs boson now, is what if the Higgs is the one talking to the dark matter? If that's the case, then the Higgs should decay to dark matter. And that's what we call Higgs invisible decays with some branching fraction, which we can put a limit on. And in the Higgs group, we, of course, look for um, Higgs decays uh, that are invisible. Um, and so one of, one of those is Higgs to ZZ star, <laughs> where Z and Z star go to neutrinos. Uh, but we also look for heavy Higgs is this way, but we, we try to constrain the Higgs invisible branching fraction that way. We use um, different production channels, so the Higgs produced in association with uh, quarks, that's called vector boson fusion, um, associated with a single vector boson W or Z, or the, the uh, inclusive gluon fusion type channel uh, in the bottom where you have extra radiation that you use to tag that uh, final state. So you look at all of these production channels and you look for missing energy plus uh, the production channel, you compare it to what you would expect in the standard model. And uh, in the past, we would just use that data, if we didn't see a signal, to put a limit on the branching fraction for Higgs to invisible. But then you can also reinterpret the same data in the context of a Higgs portal model where the Higgs is talking to dark matter and, and convert that into, again, a nuclear cross-section versus the dark matter mass. And here, because the Higgs is decaying to the dark matter, clearly you can't have, uh, once you get to up to half the Higgs mass, 60 GeV, then you, you cut off. But below that, you can set limits on dark matter um, production via the Higgs boson uh, down to low values, roughly one GeV or even less. Okay. Atlas has also done all of this, of course. Whenever you see a CMS plot, you can infer an Atlas plot and vice versa. There are very rare cases where one has not done what the other has. And uh, there's another way to show it, um, again, in the cross-section versus dark matter mass uh, plane, the digest, uh, the dominance of the digest exclusion all the way across the board. And these are the sum com combined together, all of the missing energy plus X, where X is a photon or a Z or a jet, uh, and we're working on Higgs. Okay, and relative to, in this case, Lux. Okay, so um, I want to get to flavor physics, too, so I'm going to which may surprise you, but uh, in my past, as Nima mentioned, I have a past in flavor physics, but also LHCB is doing excellent physics, and I want to get to uh, LHCB as well. Uh, so we have standard resonance searches. You can look for, just where, like we look for dark matter in missing energy plus X, we can look for X decay into any uh, di system, di electron, di muon, di jet, di photon, et cetera, di boson. Uh, in this case, with electrons, you see the Z pole, and then you go out as far as you can as far as your data will allow you, and in, all, in half of the 2016 data, actually, or a third, uh, the highest electron pair we saw was a little bit less than 2 TeV, and the fun thing here was that this event showed up in August of 2015, 
only like a few months after we started really taking data, which was very precocious and had, you know, if you took the p-value for that one event, it was crazy. Um, it wasn't five sigma, but it was four sigma-ish. Uh, and then uh, we were waiting for more to show up, but they didn't. So that one event is still sitting there, and now the background, boop, perfectly explains it. In the new data, we have a new uh, uh, winner for the highest mass candidate, daimyon mass candidate in CMS, 2.4 TEV event, which was taken on June 27th, about a month ago. Uh, looks like that. These are beautiful events, of course, very clean, uh, even though there's lots of pileup. Right? There's lots of yellow on the inside. Those are all charged particles reconstructed, but clearly separated from the daimyon pair. So that search goes on. It'll, it'll continue until we stop taking data. You can also search in, uh, with new tools, not really that new now. It's about 10 years old that people have seriously been using boosted objects or developing the tools required to look for boosted objects at the LHC, where boosted means really Lorentz boosted. So you have a very high momentum particle, either a top quark or a W or a Z or a Higgs. And then it decays. And because it's high momentum, it's highly collimated. The decay products are very highly collimated. If you have a top quark decay and it doesn't have too much momentum, then all the B goes this way, the W goes that way, the two quarks from the W go again uh, with some angle between them. But as soon as you crank up the momentum of the top, everybody becomes collimated, and so you have a big jumble of final state particles, jets and B jets, uh, or leptons if the W decays leptonically, all overlapping each other. And you have to be able to um, distinguish that from just a regular QCD jet, and these are called fat jets. Uh, so we have techniques to look inside of the fat jet and see is there one object in there, two objects in there, three objects in there, is it a top, a Higgs, a W, what is it? And we can measure the mass of the constituents and, and so on. So this allows us, and here's an example, there's a top quark mass, like in a situation like this, reconstructed from highly overlapping, all bunched together and uh, hitting the detector, overlapping each other, but still being able to measure very well the top quark mass. Um, at the right value. So then once you have these tools, I can identify um, Ws without leptons, a hadronic Ws, hadronic Z, hadronic Higgs, and all hadronic top. And I can then search for um, TT bar resonances, dye boson resonances, and in particular now, um, since the end of run one, and, and now with Ernest in run two, we look for dye Higgs production from resonances, which there are plenty of options that could do that. In various final states, depending on how the Higgs decays to its favorite daughter or one of the other daughters, uh, and you have more or less sensitivity in different regions of the mass of the heavy particle. And you can see, surprisingly to many people at the time, that the most sensitive channel is actually the 4B all hadronic channel. So as long as you can trigger this event with the 4B quarks, um, you can actually, you get the big bonus from the branching fraction and you actually have the highest sensitivity. Unfortunately, with no excesses, up to about 3 TeV or so, so far. Okay. So um, I know you've talked about flavor changing neutral currents this week. Um, I don't know how much flavor physics that was discussed, but flavor physics, of course, uh, one of its niches is to search for um, anomalous fl uh, flavor changing neutral currents that are not tiny like in the standard model, but have some rate that we can actually measure and do some physics with that at a very high scale, much higher than the center of mass energy of your accelerator. And the idea here is that we have a standard model amplitude, which has a phase, or a weak phase and a strong phase, and then a supersymmetric uh, amplitude that has a different phase, potentially. And when you add these two up to get the same final state, you have to do it in the quantum mechanics way, and so they interfere. So it's like an in interferometry experiment where you measure the phase difference between the two quantum paths, essentially. And when you do that, you get access to, uh, because the mass in here is unbounded, you, that you have to integrate all the way up to infinity in that loop, you have access to effects at very high scale because of this interference effect, uh, even though your center of mass energy is much lower. And the classic example of that is KK bar mixing, which can give you limits on extra particles in the context of first and second generation um, couplings at the 10 to the 4 GeV level, so way higher than we'll ever have in, a, in an LHC type situation. Okay, so um, that's the main idea. Maybe you've heard of that before. Maybe you've always thought, is that really, does that work? Is that, is that just stuff they tell us because we haven't seen anything elsewhere? Oops, <laughs> I already give it away. I forgot to make that 
uh, <laughs> animated. This is actually work. Of course, does. I wouldn't have a slide if it didn't work. And the classic example of this, other than beta decay, by the way, which is a way to find the W boson in a GEV level process, uh, is to look at BB bar mixing. And this was the first indication that the TT bar, direct from experiment, uh, indication that the top was really heavy, not just tens of GEV, but over 100 GEV. And the way that worked was to have uh, these diagrams, these box-like diagrams, which are loops, quantum loops, that uh, you have to do the same game in. <clears throat> and you could have new particles in these loops, and they could affect the rate of the uh, mixing. But more importantly, it's also a gym-type mechanism where the gym mechanism cancels processes when the quarks are um, degenerate. But at the top, of course, is highly non-degenerate with the B. The mass degeneracy is, is broken uh, maximally. And that led to a very high mixing rate, much higher than people expected. This X, which is the, the mass difference between the mass eigenstates divided by the width of the B meson, was much, much higher than what anybody was really predicting. And this is related directly to the top quark mass squared in the equation here, which I lifted from the, the paper which you can see the bias because they don't even have VT, uh, VTB in here because <laughs> they just assume it's equal to one. So one squared is one. Uh, and so they did this and they, they, you could then take this, the measurement they made, and they made a measurement, not just a limit, but they had a lower bound. And you can infer a top quark mass from this. And so many people did uh, even before <laughs> the, the experimental result came out. Um, there must have been people talking because look at the, this is Vizlet B192, page 245, and the theory using this result is on page 201. <laughs> so, so and, and this one was actually submitted before the experimental result. <laughs> the theorist submitted in March and the experimentalist submitted in April. So there was some kind of collusion going on, to use a popular word. <clears throat> okay, so this happens uh, many times in the history of particle physics where you get access to a higher uh, energy scale um, certainly can't produce in, uh, from the epsilon top quarks on shell or even, uh, yeah, top quarks in the final state. So we were able to access and find out that the top quark was heavy because we measured a uh, sort of 10 GeV scale process. So that's the idea. Uh, we keep going, hoping to be lucky again. Uh, one particularly hot topic these days is the decay of a B meson into K star, so uh, vector um, K on and uh, muons. That could happen in the standard model, does happen in the standard model via a um, flavor changing neutral current, but not at tree level, at loop level. So the B becomes an S, and uh, you have a W on the top in the loop, and you give a photon, which decays to the muons. Uh, and so you have a Q squared, a momentum transfer, which comes from the photon. And as a function of that, you can look at the angular variables for, of the muons and the K star, the K, on, the K star decays to K and pi. So you have four angles. You can do a fancy decomposition of all that. And there's one parameter, which is given the um, name P5 prime, which relates to the Wilson coefficient C9, which relates to a sor sort of Z prime-like neutral object, which we can insert instead of the photon in here. And what LHC bound, LHCB found a few years ago is that in a few bins of Q squared, there is an excess at the level of about three sigma deviation in this one coefficient in the angular decomposition of this final state which, like I said, might indicate a Z prime. So uh, other people have measured it now, Bell, CMS. In fact, Atlas just came out with one a few weeks ago. And you have different standard model predictions based on how you look at it, uh, one of which was the one uh, that um, LHCB was looking at, this DHMV. And that's the one where they saw an excess here in these two bins. And Bell kind of confirmed that a little bit, but then CMS is perfectly uh, agreeing with, in fact, either um, prediction. So this is still on the table. Uh, it doesn't seem to be confirmation across the board, but uh, if this were to become five sigma, then we'd have to start talking realistically about virtual particles in the loop in that uh, decay chain. There are other types of what we call flavor tension in flavor physics. <clears throat> it's always tension, not anomalies. Uh, and they involve uh, testing lepton universality. So there are two ways to test lepton universality in flavor physics that have become interesting lately. One of which is, again, the same final state, but instead of looking at angular distributions, you compare the decay rate where the leptons are electrons or muons. And you, can, in fact, can make a double ratio. K star mu mu over J, K star, K star J psi with muons, and the same with electrons. And that cancels essentially all of the 
uh, systematic uncertainties that arise from theory, most of them, and experimental because you're taking this double ratio, the muon efficiencies uh, um, cancel out and the electron efficiencies cancel out. So it's uh, a very robust variable, which should agree with the standard model prediction of one. That is, there should be no difference at the scale between electrons and muons. And what LHCB has found is that it's not one, it's 0.7, roughly, and in fact, independent of Q squared within these uncertainties. So, uh, this is interesting. The B factories did measure this quantity as well, but with much larger error bars. So it's, it's not, uh, they tend to line up with the standard model, but with large error bars. So they're consistent with LHCB, and LHCB has a sort of two sigma-ish discrepancy with the standard model. Okay, the last one here is, um, again, looking at lepton universality, but in semi-leptonic B decay. So you have a B that decays, spitting out a W. It's like beta decay, but for B mesons instead of pions. Uh, and then you have a D or D star in the final state, and then you have a lepton, which can be electron, muon, or tau, of course, and if lepton universality holds, um, apart from the fact that the tau is 1.8 GeV and the muon is 200 MeV, you should get the same answer for both, adjusted by those kinematics, which we know very well. So you make a ratio of uh, tau over mu, and you uh, measure that in D star and D, and then you plot in a 2D plane, which you get. The standard model is here at 0 0.3, 0.26 roughly, and the average, the world average is here, driven by a Babar measurement that actually my postdoc did, my last postdoc on Babar, who transitioned to CMS with me. While he was, this is 2012, while he was uh, having fun with the Higgs, in his spare time he was doing this, and then I remember when he showed it to me and I said, oh, well, you know, three sigma and flavor phase comes and goes. But then LHCB, or Bell actually measured uh, here, and then LHCB has these measurements, not in a 2D plane, but um, measuring our D star itself, and then so you have to drag bands to the right. Imagine that there are bands here. Um, so they all agree, but the LHCB tends to agree more with the standard model if you just um, you know, move these over. Um, but everybody sort of agrees that our D star is bigger than the standard model value. The question remains when LHCB squeezes these error bars much, much smaller, will they start to move down or not? This is also problematic theoretically because there are not a lot of ways to easily explain why we, saw, we would see this but not something else already because this is a tree, right? This is not a loop. It's a tree level process. Okay, but anyway, it's interesting. It's out there. LHCB is, is working on it. Super, B, Super Bells must be working on it, so we'll find out more. Okay, I want to close with some happy news, measurements of a particle that we have found at the LHC, a new particle. Not a new physics particle, but a new particle. Uh, there it is. Um, so this is the ZZ star final state where you have electrons and muons, so it's the, the classic four lepton final state, uh, which shows up exactly, almost exactly in between the Z, the direct Z to four lepton decay, which is, you know, n has nothing to do with the Higgs, and the rise from the inclusive production of ZZ star. Right in the middle there was the Higgs, and if it was higher or lower, it would have been a little bit more difficult to find. Um, we've measured the mass again. In fact, we've measured the mass better than the combination from ATLAS and CMS uh, using all the data we have now in run two. So the CMS only measurement is more precise than the CMS plus ATLAS run one measurement already. So that's what I meant about the precision era is starting. Now we have three points, actually two points make a line, but three points makes an even more interesting line, seven, eight, and 13 TeV. Uh, the cross-section that's determined from the four-lepton final state for the Higgs production, and it's exactly standard model. We can also uh, get fancy and start making um, plots of the PT of the Higgs, um, differential cross-section distributions versus uh, any variable you can think of. They all look to be matching the predictions from the generators that we have looked at. And then uh, there's this way to access the Higgs width by looking at interference between um, the Higgs decay on-shell and the Higgs decay off-shell. Uh, with some assumptions. And uh, instead of having GeV type limits on the Higgs width, we can get down to 40 MeV. And the standard model value you may know is 4 MeV. So we're only 10 times the standard model limit at the, mom at the moment uh, with this technique. And uh, this will become much more interesting in the future. Of course, we'll have to release, release or reduce some of the assumptions we make, but that looks promising. This is a, from run one, the combination of Atlas and CMS, so the best results we had from run one. Um, for the couplings of the standard model particles to the Higgs, the ones that we can actually measure, so the top, 
the Z, the W, the B, the Tau, and in the future of the mu, we have search for mu, but we only have limits, of course. Uh, and then if everybody had a single VEV, if there was only one Higgs boson, one VEV, one uh, that's driving the Yukawa couplings for all the fermions, then it, and also driving the electroweak symmetry breaking that gives us the W and Z mass, everybody should line up on the same line in this plot, and they do within those uncertainties. So that's why we think uh, that this guy is um, standard model-like, also because the spin is not two, and it, we know it's not one because it decays the photons, so it looks like it's spin zero. It doesn't look like a pseudoscalar, so it looks like a scalar and has all the properties and the couplings that we expect. So uh, Nima mentioned it. Unfortunately, it's not my experiment, but <laughs> we're, we're coming very soon with our result, uh, stay tuned. But the first evidence for H to BB bar at the LHC coming from Atlas uh, two weeks ago at the EPS conference. Beautiful result. When you background subtract, you do some fancy uh, boosted decision tree with, which tries to separate the background from the signal, which shows up on the very right-hand side in the red, and they see an excess there. If you background subtract in the mass plot, the mass of the two jets, this guy's dying, then you get the Z boson. So here are events like Z, Z, where the Z goes to BB bar, or W, Z, where the Z goes to BB bar, and you're, you're seeing the Z boson. But right next door, you have Higgs to BB bar, and you see the separation that the experiments have now. The resolution is good enough to see the two uh, bumps, and once we have much more data, we should start to really see a bump there. Right now, it's a shoulder, but it's a significant shoulder. It has three-point sigma observed, combining all of their data together. And you can see how the data aligns here between uh, 7 TeV, where they had a deficit, unlucky in 7 TeV, but then they've been quite lucky recently. And uh, CMS has more or less the same sensitivity. And like I said, stay tuned. There is one measurement. There might be others that I'm forgetting, but there's one measurement on that big standard model plot of all the cross sections that is deviating a little bit from the standard model expectation. And it is the coupling of the Higgs with the top. And we look at that in um, so-called TT bar H events. So the Higgs boson is produced essentially by fusing two top quarks and then looking at the event that has uh, two top quarks in the final state and looking at the Higgs in various decay channels. Um, so with leptons, photons, B quarks, et cetera. And then you try to see a rate that's not zero and you compare it with the standard model expectation for a standard model Higgs boson at 125 GeV giving you this rate. And the interesting effect here is that we do have an excess, slight excess, in the um, multi-lepton, this one, final state. That is, you should expect one, that is, this is the ratio of what you measure to the standard model prediction. So if it's standard model, you should go one. And it's a little bit higher, and it comes from this excess we see here in, again, a boosted decision tree type output. And, uh, okay, it's not far from one. It's only one sigma from one. When you add them all together, it's about a one sigma, one and a half sigma like effect, but it's a three sigma excess from zero, and it's a little bit early. We don't expect to see the TT bar Higgs process yet. So if this holds up, this would indicate that the top Yukawa coupling, which is the biggest one, obviously, is even bigger than we suspected, which would have consequences, and that would be very interesting. So this was also, we saw an excess in run one, and this is one excess from run one that seems to be not at least going away in the first year like the other ones did, but hanging around a little bit. And Atlas also has a slight excess there. Okay, finishing on time. Uh, the future is now, so we're taking data, um, not right now because the machine is um, getting a nip and tuck at the moment, but we'll come back quick. And they can't, when they turned on this year, they turned on like gangbusters faster than they have in the past. These are all the previous runs and there's a January 1st here for each year. So sort of reset the clock. And uh, the slope here is much higher than it was even last year, which was better than it was uh, previous year and so on. So they got back to the, the luminosity, the maximum luminosity from last year within a few days or a few a week or two. So it's running perfectly. Uh, the detectors are running great. We've already accumulated 90 for Sprunter Barnes. The goal is 45 for this year. I, I predict we'll get much higher than 45 unless something uh, you know, happens and they have to take less data than we expected or, or run less than we expect. But it's running very well, uh, the performance is ex excellent. So we're right here now, uh, actually second quarter of 2017, actually third quarter. Uh, we run for uh, 2018, then there's a big long shutdown, then we run, more shutdowns, and the HLLHC um, 
era starts uh, here. And then we have several runs, and then uh, by 2035, the idea is we have three inverse out of barns of data, maybe even more, depending on the, how they run the accelerator, but that's the general idea for the next uh, 15 years or so for the LHC, including the L high luminosity LHC. I'm not gonna talk about beyond that because I saw that on the schedule that Nima's gonna talk about that tomorrow, so uh, I might even come here and listen to that myself. Uh, but what are we gonna do with that data from the HLLHC? Precision Higgs physics, we can get couplings down to 5%. We'll finally start to see mu mu, as I mentioned. Um, we'll be constraining more um, exotic type Higgs couplings, uh, squeezing as much as we can. At this point, if we still haven't seen new physics in, uh, certainly in the next two years, but also, oh sorry, certainly in the next 10 years, um, but also if by the time 2030 rolls around, there's no new physics, Precision standard model measurements have always been new physics searches because if you see a deviation, voila, you have some indication of non-standard model physics. So this will become much more important. It will increase in, in, its important, in, in its importance and in particular for rare processes um, where the systematics may not be driving everything uh, and may be hard to reduce. Um, this will become more and more important. And then, of course, we'll continue searching for everything we're searching for now and all of the cool stuff that theorists come up with with between now and then, which they're always coming up with cool stuff. So this is a picture of what it might look like in the future, the far future, 3,000 inverse Fanta barns, three inverse Atta barns, all of the couplings on the plot I just showed. Now with the muon coupling actually being measured, if it is standard model-like. If it's not standard model-like, then we should see uh, it off the curve there. And actually, yeah, I'm gonna leave you with that. So this is the, basically the, the known future for the next uh, 20, 18 years or so uh, at, at the LHC. So I'll end it there, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.